Well, good evening and welcome to another legal webinar uh, with KCA and Steptoe and Johnson. Um, you all know Candace Smith. She's been with us on our previous legal webinars, and I'm going to turn it over to her in just a sec. Tonight's guest speaker is Greg Jackson, and he's going to introduce himself a little bit later, but we are going to explore insurance and agriculture tonight. Um, this topic is timely due to the pandemic and just some of the natural uh, disasters that we've had due to flooding or the tornadoes or ice. Um, so I thought that was a good topic to go over tonight. Um, I want to thank Candace and Greg for coming on with us tonight. I know everybody is busy, so we are recording. And if you can't catch it live tonight, we hope that you'll tune into our uh, YouTube channel and watch it at a later date. So Candace, I'm going to turn it over to you. You're looking well. How are you doing tonight? Thank you. I'm doing well. I'm happy to be back again with all of you. Um, and thank you for taking time on a beautiful evening to talk about insurance with us. Um, but we did, like Nikki said, want to address this because I think it's been a hard year for a lot of businesses and in a lot of different industries, people were hit hard with the pandemic. And then um, a lot of our state was just devastated with these ice storms and flooding. And so we want to think about what can we do to be proactive to try to you know, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. And so be ready if these kind of disasters happen again, but also be ready for the day-to-day -day things that might happen, um, like a car wreck or a cow getting loose or a building catching fire, things like that. So um, I'm glad to have Greg here with us today as a colleague of mine, an expert on insurance issues. So he will um, be able to answer a lot of questions, both that I prepared, but also feel free to ask questions during the presentation. We want to try to make it interactive and be able to address whatever concerns you might have. Um, and just a little bit about me for those of you who have not attended the webinars before. I'm from a small town in Western Kentucky and my um, I grew up next to my grandfather who had a garden and raised cattle and horses just kind of for fun in his retirement. And I did not get his green thumb, but I did get his love for agriculture and local farmers, local food. And so for the past probably two years, I've been working with Kentucky Cattlemen to try to figure out what the legal needs are for the farming community and what we can do to provide education, resources, things like that so you can be prepared, um, make your business the best it can be. So we've done a presentation already on liability, um, like what could happen if you have an accident on your farm. And this insurance webinar really piggyback on that. So um, you might find some information in the recorded webinar we've already done that'd be helpful too. So um, I'm an attorney at Steptoe and Johnson. I love being able to bring in my coworkers to be able to talk about their expertise. So I'm gonna throw it over to Greg now. Uh, yeah, good evening. Um, like Candace said, my name is Greg Jackson. I work with Candace at Steptoe where I'm also an attorney. Um, I practice litigation, um, including a good amount of insurance coverage and insurance litigation. Um, so that's part of the reason why Candace brought me in to talk a little bit today. Um, my family has a history. My grandfather was uh, a member of the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association, as was my father. Um, we raised feeder cattle when I was growing up, and uh, I was uh, excited at the chance when Candace invited me to come on and speak and hopefully uh, give everyone some good information and some insights into insurance, how it works, um, what you need to look out for, um, and, and I think it will segue well from the earlier presentations on, on what to do if you have an accident, because we're talking kind of like, what insurance coverage do you need to protect yourself um, if an accident were to happen on your farm, as well as um, to protect your property, the buildings that might be on your farm, the equipment, um, a little bit about livestock, what's available for that, um, and then kind of some pitfall, pitfalls and areas you want to look to uh, when you're dealing with crop insurance as well. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, well, Nikki, unless you've got anything else, I think we can go ahead and get started. I don't. And Greg, thank you for that introduction. We're happy to have you tonight. I'm happy for, obviously, as the membership coordinator for your father and grandfather's membership in the past. So, um, no, I think that we're good. So we'll turn it over to you. Great. And we did um, send out a handout ahead of time that has some terms. But if there's other terms that we mentioned that you would like some more information about, feel free to add that the chat with Q&A. We all want to make sure that 
we, um, you know, are playing from the same playbook and everything. So um, I guess we will get started with just kind of, Greg, what are some first steps that you would suggest that people take if they want to get a different kind of insurance or change the kind of insurance coverage they already have? So what you what you really need to look for when you're going to get insurance is you want to find an agent that you know, that you trust, but also they need to be familiar with the type with your type of operation. Um, you need someone who regularly deals with the type of farming farming you're doing. For instance, if you do cow calf, the needs and areas of coverage that you may be are going to be different from someone who raises crops such as corn or tobacco. And the same is true for um, those farmers who, uh, who who raise crops. I mean, what you need to protect the equipment that you have, the um, materials that you're going to be working with, the areas of risk are different, and you need an agent that understands those areas of risk in the operation, as well as the ins and outs of the coverage that is available. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit later about crop insurance. It is particularly true with crop insurance to have an agent who understands what you're growing, how you're growing it, and what you're gonna do um, after it's grown, if you're gonna sell it or you're gonna use it for, for grain, uh, for feed, that sort of thing, so. And how would a farmer know how much insurance or what type of insurance he or she needs? So this kind of goes back to, you're gonna be relying on your agent frequently for them to let you know what is out there what is available, um, how the coverage may work, how it may impact different aspects of your operation. Um, when it comes down to the amount of coverage you have, uh, the type of coverage you have, and the expense of the coverage that you're purchasing, it comes down to the risk versus the cost. You can purchase as much insurance as they will sell you. You can cover everything. Um, but you're gonna pay for that. You're also gonna pay for lower deductibles. Uh, on the other hand, you, if you don't purchase enough insurance, you can leave yourself exposed. So it's possible to overpay and be too covered. It's possible to, to underpay and not have enough coverage. Um, and also you need to look at what do you wanna protect? If you have, for instance, a barn on the farm that you don't use that is run down and you're actually thinking about tearing down, well, I may not put that on, list that as a structure on my insurance based on my agent's recommendations um, because I don't want to protect that. If it caught fire, I don't, I don't care because I'm not using it. Um, so that's, that's where you balance the risk and the cost. You don't want to pay for the premium for a building or something that you don't want to protect. Is there, and this is a question we received from some of the members, um, is there anything that might not be covered by a farm insurance policy? So yes, there are gonna be, when you, when you get your insurance policy, there will be exclusions that will specifically preclude coverage of certain issues. Um, for instance, uh, I dealt with one case that dealt with hail damage to tobacco. Um, and it was pretty clear from the policy, there's an exclusion for hail under the crop coverage. So you need to look at that because there may be specific instances that might kick out coverage. Um, another example uh, may be with, if you're dealing with livestock, certain diseases or causes of death to the livestock may not be covered. Um, similarly for your, if you had a, a commercial general liability policy. Certain actions may not be covered. Um, for instance, you know, with commercial general liability, um, generally those are not gonna cover intentional acts. If you intentionally did something that ended up hurting someone, those may not be covered. Um, or if you intentionally um, decided, we, we were talking about that barn earlier, it's, it's not worth anything. I'm gonna burn it if you intentionally set it on fire. You, probably could not then make a claim for repairing or replacing that structure since you burned it down. Um, th those are the types of things that won't be covered, that may not be covered based on the terms of your policy, but you wanna look at the exclusions. Um, and then you also want to um, make sure, go again, go back to your agent. If there's something in there that you don't understand or you thought was covered, um, you may wanna get some clarification. Say, I, I thought this was covered and this is what I wanted. 
and, and they should be able to address the issue. Okay, and along those same lines, do you have any suggestions for kind of, I guess, best practices when dealing with your agent or trying to, you know, get a certain type of insurance? Yeah, so the I would say the most important thing is just to document, document, and, and document what your agent is telling you, what you're asking him for, him or her for, um, the types of coverages and the events that your agent has told you will be covered under your policy. Um, I mean, the best practice is to confirm in writing to your agent, um, ask in writing to your agent so that you have a written document of what you typed out. And it won't, if there was a coverage issue, it would not be a he said, she said um, scenario. The second best thing is to take notes. Um, I spoke with my agent, John Smith, on April 6, 2021, and he said that the hail damage to my tobacco crops were covered. And you have a note, and that corroborates what you would say later in the claims process or if it went to litigation, and that'll help both bolster your testimony. It'll also help you remember, because it's better to be specific about the date that you spoke with someone and know exactly when it happened It'll help jog your memory down the road and it'll help you basically appear more convincing if you had to testify in court. Um, this actually occurred, I, I spoke about the, the hail damage to the tobacco crop. That gentleman, um, it was excluded under his policy. However, he had spoken with his agent and had a note written down, just like I was just saying, that he spoke with his agent on you know April 6, 2021. And my agent told me that day, that the damage to my tobacco crop was covered. So he got a, a portion of it. It was the, the note was that this portion of this field, the agent said it was covered. So because the agent said it was covered, that was an agent of the insurance company and we were actually arbitrating. We were making the decision. We felt that the agent had the authority to bind the insurance company. Um, and because he had the writing, we ended up finding for him. So that is an instance or an example of, of, of why you need to document what, what you're telling your agent, what your agent is telling you. And um, it can help you down the road. It can help cover something that may fall outside the policy if your agent told you that it was. Um, it can also help you expand the coverage um, under the policy, depending on what's been said. So I would say document every policy and every scenario is different. So just because they tell you something one time may not necessarily mean that it's gonna be covered, but it's better to have those notes and that documentation to give yourself a fighting chance if it could possibly fall within the coverage and it can save you a lot of money uh, down the road. And I would also add, keep a co copy of your policy, um, request a copy and keep a copy of it. They should mail you a copy, but make sure you keep that um, just for your own record. So if you do have a question, you can look at it. Um, we talked about exclusions. Those can be wordy. The definitions can be wordy too, but at least you can look at it and try to, and, and, and read it yourself and see if you think something falls in or out. So that, that, that'll help down the road as well. Thank you. That's really good advice. Um, and we talked some about things like a barn burning. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar now with like car accidents and things like that, when you might want to make a claim with your insurance company. But can you give us some other examples of when a farmer might want to make a claim with the insurance company to have the insurer pay for some sort of like loss or damage they've experienced? Yes. So I think that the probably the easiest way to break this down is into three categories. Um, the first one, we talked about a barn burning down, but it, it's damage to your property that's uh, either resulting from your own mistake or accident um, or events outside of your control. So um, one example we talked about, go with the barn burning down. Well, if it got struck by lightning, that'd be an event outside of your control, weather event. That might be something that you want to make a claim for if, if that dwelling is covered under your policy and um, you want to replace it or, or, or you need to repair it in some way. Um, another one might be if you were burning brush and the fire got away from you and it spread through the field and then hit, uh, took down your barn. Um, that could be one potentially that might be covered where your own mistake or accident um, and resulted in the fire getting out of control and burning down your barn. Um, 
another one, uh, it, well, you know, you drive your own tractor through your fence for some reason, or you back up and you knock down, um, damage the tractor or damage the fence, and it's worth it for you based on your deductible and your available coverage to make a claim for that to get a repair of the tractor, replace the fence, et cetera. Those might be some areas where you are making a claim for property damage against your own insurance company. Um, similarly, what we'd also find in that is if you injured yourself um, driving the tractor or something like that, hurt yourself, it was, if it was worth it based on your policy to make a claim, you're making a couple claim against your own coverage um, for your insurance company to basically reimburse you or uh, pay out to you to cover your injury. Um, another one would be damage to someone else. This is where your accident or your mistake causes an injury to someone else, and then they're making a claim against you, and your insurance company is defending you, and then paying for any damages, up, and it's usually written where it's up to the limits of insurance available under the policy. So go with the uh, example of your fire, your burning brush, fire gets out of control, instead of crossing the field and, on, and burning down your barn, it burns down your neighbor's barn then they would make a claim against you um, saying that you negligently burned the brush resulting in the burning down of their barn, partial or whole, and they should be compensated for that. So they're making a claim against you and your insurance company to the extent there's coverage, but then pay for your neighbor's claim. Um, otherwise, I mean, think about if, if you and your, if your neighbor was helping you build fence or something and you somehow injured him, if you, um, well, when I was a kid, we were putting in steel posts and I was holding the steel post and the head came off the sledge and hit me in the thigh. If that had happened to your neighbor and it broke his, broke his leg somehow, um, he might be able to make a claim against you for negligently dropping the hammer on him or not securing the head of the sledgehammer properly and, and it resulting in hitting him. There was an injury that he can make a claim against it's you and again the insurance company would cover you and then potentially pay out uh, to cover that claim and settle it um the, the third one is uh damage to you by someone else and the, the reverse of you damaging your neighbor's barn if your neighbor damaged your barn for, in some way brush fire or you know drove his tractor into it would be making a claim against your neighbor and then the insurance company would then be um, paying that paying that out to you is kind of the third general area. Thank you. Um, and then so how if some of these situations happens and there is loss or damage, how would a farmer go about getting the insurance company to pay them? Yeah, so you're, you're going to be making a claim. So most oftentimes you're going to be making it directly to your agent, call your agent and say, I have had X, Y, or Z happen. Um, hail has damaged my crops. I've had a calf die. Um, I rolled my tractor, something like that. There's an event, you call your agent, and then they should help you through the process. The other thing is you want to pay attention to the requirements of your policy. It's going to dictate when, how, and when and how you make the claim and who you make the claim to. Um, timing can be important, excuse me, particularly if it's a claims made basis policy, which is based on the timing of the claim. Um, you may need to make that within the policy period, but all those details should be. Um, laid out in the insurance policy. So that's another reason why you want to get a copy of your insurance policy and keep it uh, when you first get insurance is that can tell you how and when to make the claim tell. Um, there's also a difference between making a claim and putting the carrier on notice that there might be a claim. Um, a lot of times we will see this in the second scenario we talked about where you have caused damage to someone else's property or um, caused injury to someone else. If they are indicating that they may be, or if you believe that they may make a claim, you may have a duty to put the carrier on notice when you learn of that potential claim. Um, but generally, if something happens, I would say call, call your agent and they should be able to help you through it. 
And what kind of documentation would a farmer need if he or she is injured on the farm? That was another question I received from one of the members. Yeah, so injury on the farm, I think the main thing is you want to document everything that you can. So where did this happen? How did it happen? If, for instance, um, you had an accident operating the tractor, if it rolled over um, and you were injured as a result of that, well, maybe you want to take pictures of where the tractor was when before it rolled over, where it ended up, how it got there, um, and, and then document your medical treatment as well. Keep the bills. Um, if you can get obtain copies of your medical records or allow the carrier to obtain copies of your medical records, you want to make sure you keep a copy for yourself to the best you can. Um, you want to be able to document what treatment you've had, um, where you had it, when you had it, why you had it, what they said, and then how much did you pay? How much money are you out or how much are they asking you to pay so that you can pass that along to the insurance carrier uh, potentially for reimbursement. Uh, of, of your injuries. I just want to piggyback off that. I know that um, that's another question I actually just got texted as well. I know it was on our submitted form, but, you know, I think when disasters happen, you know, your barn falls down or catches fire, you are, you know, in a rollover um, tractor accident. The, the last thing you think about is taking pictures or, you know, but it, I've read too many times where um, documentation or you've waited too long to file your claim and it's not covered. And so I think that does need to be stressed of, um, you know, it doesn't have to be right that minute, but get your documentation. Um, like you said, get whatever receipts that you have or medical treatments that you have and take pictures and don't wait too long, you know, to, to file that claim with your insurance. Yeah, absolutely. And we see it oftentimes when we are um, looking at, not necessarily on an insurance coverage issue, but when we are litigating a, a, a tort injury or something like that, when people have documentation, it frequently can help their claim. You, When you're making a claim, you're asking the insurance company to pay you money and you need to show them why they should pay you is basically what you're doing and you need to document it. And then you, you, you do need to timely make the claim and speak with your agent in a, in a timely manner. That's, that's also key. Are there any other suggestions or best practices for making a claim that we didn't cover? You gave us a lot yeah, of- Yeah, I think I would on. just add is, yeah, I think I would add is that, that when you make a claim, um, if you don't have a copy of your policy, um, you may want to ask for a complete copy of the policy just so that you have it. Um, even if you do have it, um, I have in the past asked for certified copies of the policy just to make sure that you have a full copy and that you're working with all the pieces to the puzzle. Um, so that there's not something that you miss. You don't want um, to if you had to get a lawyer to litigate coverage, you don't want to show up and give them part of a policy and then have them go advise you wrongly or, or get too far down the road and take the wrong strategy or tactic. So I would say ask for a copy of your policy as well. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Nikki. Nope, just another follow-up question. Um, so at what point do you get an attorney involved? say with the insurance claims? At what point do you need to seek out that yeah. legal representation? I think that varies from person to person. And it, 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 it's a decision is when you get an attorney involved, you are raising the stakes, I think, in the carrier's eye. Um, it also, if you are working on a contingency fee basis with that attorney that may reduce the amount that you recover. However, I think when you become dissatisfied with the process and you feel that it is not going the way that you want or they are not adequately compensating you based on what you've seen, that's when you wanna look at counsel um, 
talk to someone, talk to a lawyer that you trust. If you have a relationship with them, find someone that does litigate insurance issues. Um, and, and hopefully they'll let you know whether or not it's a good idea to get them involved because frankly, sometimes it may really be worth it. Um, and sometimes it may not be, sometimes you may end up losing on the deal or, uh, it may be a, end up being more trouble than it's worth because litigation is very stressful um, is another thing to think about. But yes, eventually, sometimes you do need to speak with a lawyer. Well, and Greg, that kind of answered like when maybe with your own insurance, you know, if you were needing, you feel like your loss was greater than the payment you received, things like that. But what about one of the other scenarios, like your neighbor burns your barn down? So you ask your neighbor, you know, to pay for it, but they don't have insurance or their insurance denies, you know, your request to your neighbor, that kind of thing. I feel like that'd be another situation where a lawyer might be able to help you get coverage, but not from your own insurance company, from someone else's. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. So if you are making a claim to your neighbor, you one scenario could be they have coverage, they have great insurance and they pay out pretty quickly. Do you think it's a fair amount? Um, then, you know, I mean, you might want to have a lawyer look at this before you sign it because you can give up a lot of rights um the other one is there is coverage but the insurance company wants to fight you you may end up having to retain a lawyer to file suit um and the third one would be there's not coverage they've denied coverage um and then you may also have to file suit against your neighbor if if, if it is worth it in your in your view to go down that path and litigate against your neighbor um the the thing i would say though is um when you when you talk about hiring a neighbor when you, when you have coverage issues i think counsel can help a lot of times uh bringing a claim against someone else i would be more inclined to bring counsel in in those scenarios versus just versus the insurance company um but it varies from person to person. So some people may be more litigious and want to fight more quickly than, than other people. Um, and it, it will also change your relationship that you have for using the neighbor example. Um, if you sue your neighbor, uh, they are not going to be very pleased. So it may impact that relationship as well. Right. Those are some good things to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, we've discussed a lot of just kind of basics about insurance and things that would affect a lot of different businesses. And I appreciate you tailoring it to a farming, but I think we're going to go like one step further and talk even more specifically about um, some agriculture insurance issues. So um, the next part, we're going to cover land and property as well as general coverage, then equipment and autos, livestock and crop insurance. So if anybody has questions about those things, we'll be addressing those pretty soon and feel free to ask those questions. Um, but first about land and property coverage. Um, is there anything particular a farmer should know about land and property insurance? So I think one of the main things you need to understand is the purpose of it. And so the property insurance is designed to cover damage to your property, um, including the buildings and structures on it. We talked earlier about a barn that you don't necessarily use it may be run down and leaky you don't use it anymore well if you're not using it you may not want to list it um, that's something you should probably bring up with your agent but you need to list those dwellings and structures that are important to you um if you are using a uh a uh a tobacco barn for instance if you're using that every year that's probably something that you probably want to put on there um Additionally, it's designed to cover damage to your property from events such as storms or fire or that you may accidentally cause. Um, we talked earlier about a brush fire that gets out of control. That's, that's kind of what it's designed to do is protect your property. Additionally, it may cover, it may provide you some liability coverage um, if you made a mistake or an accident and caused someone else to be injured or damaged someone else's property while they were on your property, um, you may have some coverage for any claims they may make against you. Um, and that falls into that kind of that second category. And, and really what we were talking about with your neighbor, just be the reverse of, um, you know, you backed 
the tractor into your neighbor's truck while he's helping you get cattle up. And he wants to recover from you for, you got to replace the bed of his truck that may be covered under your policy. And that's kind of what it's designed to cover on the liability side. So, and then I would add when you're, when you're dealing with dwellings um, or barns or the structures, be specific about the size and what you use them for. Um, I dealt with one coverage issue for a gentleman who had put an apartment above his barn and was renting it out um, to a, a, a young man. And the young man ended up causing a fire in the apartment and it burned the barn down. Well, he had listed it as solely agriculture, not residential and not any kind of rental in there. And there was an exclusion for if you were renting the place out. And so we denied coverage. Coverage was denied because uh, it didn't fall within the parameters of what he said he was using his building for. Um, so at the beginning of it, it said, told his agent, I'm going to rent out the top room. Then they could have uh, changed the coverage so that it would have covered that. But be specific in, in what you intend to use it for. If the use changes, then you probably want to contact your agent as well to make sure that there is that it's still covered, um, or that you need to change coverage, just so that you don't end up with a barn burning down or something else happening um, to your property, and you get stuck with the bill rather than the insurance company because you mistake, made a mistake or you didn't properly list. Uh, the dwelling building or what you're using it for. Um, and then how can a farmer yeah. who rents the farm be protected? Well, I, I think that you need to be specific about with your agent about what you're using the farm. I mean, there may be different coverages for whether or not you own it or whether or not you have a mortgage on the property, uh, whether you're renting the property. Um, I have not dealt with rental of a farm specifically. However, I will say that this seems analogous to um, a, a shop that leases space in a shopping center, for instance. You can get property coverage that covers your shop and its contents. And then um, the landlord may require you to insure the portion of the building or insure up to a certain amount if you did something that caused damage to the building. For instance, I have a client that they are required to carry coverage for water damage if they caused a leak or their plumbing caused a leak that they had installed that damaged the rest of the building, then they would have insurance coverage for it and they were required to have that. So I think that if you speak with your agent, you should be able to get something along those similar lines. I guess vice versa, if you're renting your farm out, you might want to talk to your agent about, like you said, having the tenant get some sort of coverage, right? Yes, getting some kind of coverage for yourself or making sure that you are a named insured under their policy, um, that you have protection. Um, when you, if you own the farm, you know, that is the land is an asset. And if something happened to it and there's a judgment against you, it could potentially put the ownership of the property at risk. So you do want to make sure you're covered. Um, you probably want to speak with an attorney when preparing the lease and have that attorney address what kind of coverages you need and what kind of coverages that the, uh, the renter needs to have to protect you and make sure that you have some protection uh, against anything that might happen there. Let's see. Um, we spoke some about um, injuries on the property and things like that. Um, what specific insurance would you look to to protect yourself from liability for an injury caused by an animal or by your, um, you know, and someone that's on the farm just gets injured, that kind of thing? Um, so what, you know, in addition to the property insurance that we talked about, are there other kinds of coverage that would specifically apply to those things? Yeah, so if you're talking about personal injury, I think that there are two areas you probably want to look to. One would be in your property insurance. If you think that you may be injured or someone else may be injured and there's a risk of that, you may want to talk to your agent about potentially carrying some med pay coverage, which would be uh, coverage that often will pay out regardless of how something happened if someone's injured. 
Um, normally that's a minimal amount um, and that would cover, be designed to cover like an ER visit if someone fell and had stitches or something like that. So it would pay out for the ER visit, something like that. You know, it's normally not over five to ten thousand dollars is the area you see with a lot of homeowners policies. It, I think it would be similar with uh, farm property. The other area you want to look is what's is commercial general liability or CGL coverage. And that is designed um, to cover your liability. It frequently will extend beyond the limits of your property. So if, for instance, um, you are operating a tractor, your tractor um, down the road and you ran into someone that may provide coverage for that as well um, for, for the liability. Uh, and then finally, I think what is important is to have some kind of have a general liability and have some kind of umbrella coverage above that. Um, it's I have I have some myself. It is not horribly expensive, but particularly if you own own your farm or you own part of it and you have it mortgaged, if you if something happens and someone sues you, brings litigation, makes a claim, and they end up with a judgment that's above your limits of insurance, um, that can potentially put you at risk financially including if you can't pay the judgment, uh, put your property at risk, the ownership of your property at risk. So talk to your agent, think about how much you need. That goes back to the cost and risk. Um, some people may be comfortable with having lower, lower coverage um, because they are more willing to have a greater risk that something could happen and they could end up on the hook. On the other hand, some people, uh, are more risk averse, or they might have uh, a, a larger amount of assets that they want to protect. Um, if someone does not necessarily own a large tract of land, it may not be worth it to them um, to have as much coverage, um, whereas someone who has more to protect might want more. And just to reference one of the other webinars we did too, that was about estate planning and different business entities. In addition to the insurance that you're discussing, I think another good thing for people to keep in mind, a way to minimize potential liability from lawsuits, at least to hit them directly personally, is to use some sort of business entity like an LLC or you know, S Corp, something like that, so that as opposed to a sole proprietorship. Um, and I think our survey showed that most of the members are a sole proprietorship, but that's another pretty you know, affordable and easy way to get yourself some extra protection in addition to that insurance. Um, and then how would a farmer protect um, the employees and I guess the farmer himself or herself if the employee was injured on the farm property? So generally, I think, you, I, think I would look at uh, commercial general liability coverage. I would also look at some kind of med pay coverage. Um, and, you know, I don't practice work, I don't practice workers compensation. Um, but to the extent that you have a large number of employees, it may be worth it to look at potential workers compensation insurance. From my conversations with people in the horse industry and individuals who write agricultural insurance, it's my understanding that the, the larger operations are the ones that will carry workers' compensation insurance, and often it's the large horse farms around Kentucky that have that, um, whereas other, other entities are not, are not necessarily going the workers' compensation route. And it may be where you may want to look at the med pay because that may be an option if someone has a minor injury and they need to go to the ER, it would alleviate any kind of stress for them to have to pay the bills and maybe want to make a claim. I mean, that may just be enough to make you comfortable with the risk that you're that you're taking out. But again, I would talk to your agent. This is what I'm doing. This is how many people are working with me. These are the activities that we're engaged in. You know, some, like anything else, some portions of farming are more dangerous than other portions. And it may also depend on the equipment that you're using, how you're using it. Um, you know, mowing a flat piece of land is a lot less dangerous than mowing a, 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 on a big hill. So that simple fact right there could change whether or not you want a lot of med pay coverage, whether you want to try to get some other coverage that's out there that could protect you in the event that you roll the tractor down the hill and, you know, break your leg or something like that. 
you, you just speak with your agent about what you need, what you're doing, and the more details you can give them, the more they can help you figure out coverage that's going to protect you and make you comfortable. And with that equipment that you're using on your farm, I mean, is it insured with like an auto insurer, you know, or is it something different specific for farming equipment? So your, if you're, if, you know, you got your, a pickup truck and you're driving it on the road, you need to have auto coverage for that. Um, you have to meet, if you're going to drive it on the public roadways, a car, then you have to meet the minimum insurance requirements under the Kentucky Motor, Motor Vehicle Reparations Act. However, there's an exception for farm tractors. So there are options. One is to list it under your property coverage that you're gonna to use to cover your, your farm, your land um, for the dwellings and that sort of thing. You can potentially list it under there. However, there may be limits to what will be covered. And for instance, if you cover a tractor under your property insurance, you list it there, accidents that that may only cover accidents that occur on the farm, on your premises. So if you were driving down the road to go to another tract of land, that may not be covered. If you pop down, you were bush hogging and you wanted a, you wanted a Gatorade. So you went down to the corner store and something happened. Someone stole the tractor while you went inside to get a, get your, get a glass of water, get, you know, get your Gatorade. That may not be covered because it didn't happen on your property. So. I would encourage you to look at inland marine property coverage um, that is generally going to provide coverage for damage, loss, stolen, anywhere that that is subject to the terms of your specific policy. But generally, that's what you want to look at if you've got valuable equipment that you want to protect. And, and again, it, it, it all goes back to what are you doing? Are you going to be moving this piece of property? or excuse me, this piece of equipment from various places. You know, if you have, for instance, tobacco fields in multiple locations throughout a county and you want to um, move, your, you need to move your equipment from field to field um, and you may be driving on the road and maybe hauling it by a trailer, well, that may not be covered if something happens while you're hauling it. So then you may want to look at Inland Marine. However, if for instance, you're only going to be driving it in one field or on one piece of, property, you're not going to take it off, off the land, then the property coverage might be okay, but you need to speak with your agent, tell them what you're going to do. This is how I plan to use it. And they should be able to help you tailor your policy to get something there. And does a farmer need to insure every piece of equipment he or she owns? Yeah. So this goes back to the same thing we were talking about earlier, where if you have a piece of equipment that you aren't using or um you know i feel like everyone has a, a tractor that or at least their neighbor or they have a tractor that's rusting out back that they don't drive anymore personally if i'm not going to use it i wouldn't cover it um but then again you need to think about i mean that just goes back to to your your risk and cost analysis is it something that i think is valuable that i want to protect is could i foresee using it in the future um, what you don't want to have happen is you need it and it's not covered and something happens to it. Um, or, you know, if, if you're going to start using it, if the main tractor that you use breaks down and you need to get the other one fired up, you may want to talk to your agent and say, look, I'm going to be using this other piece of equipment now. I'd like to add it to my policy. I'd like to add some coverage for it um, just to make sure protect it protected because you don't want to end up um, without any tractors or any equipment or the necessary tools to 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 farm the land and earn a living. Greg, do you mind to repeat that coverage that you were speaking about prior um, to Candace's question um, and go over it a little bit more? You know, the, the yeah. instance where if you drive your tractor down to the corner store, do you care to repeat that again? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It is it is inland marine property coverage. And it is designed to cover your equipment um, for damage, loss, stolen when it's off of your property, basically anywhere that you are using it or hauling it or operating it. Um, obviously subject to the terms and exclusions, conditions and whatever policy you buy. 
um, or, or that you, you get from the insurance company. And, and the reason why some people may want to do that is typically the property coverage that covers your land, you can get, you can cover equipment under that often. However, the instances where the equipment is covered may be limited uh, to things that happen when it's on your property. So, you know, like I was saying, if you are moving, if you got a sprayer and you got to spray multiple, uh, multiple plots on multiple tracts of land and you're going to be driving it down the road or hauling it across town, um, there is, if someone were to run into you or you were to run into something or somebody ran you off the road and that piece of property got damaged, um, there is a risk that under your property coverage that may not be covered because it was not on the premises or area where you're working or, or, or the property that you own or the property that's covered by that specific policy. Again, it all depends on the policy that you have and the terms and the exclusions and that. Just generally, that's a risk that you may have. And if you fall into, if you're going to be moving the equipment around, driving it frequently on the road um, or hauling it, across various parts to different pieces of land, you may want to look at inland marine property coverage um, to potentially protect you um, when you're moving the equipment when it's off the land. That may be something you want to look at. Thank you for that. Um, what about, we talked about hauling equipment or moving equipment down the road. What about specifically hauling cattle? Um, what kind of insurance should we be considering for that? So I would want to look at if you're going to be hauling it, you want to be careful just relying on a regular auto policy. Frequently, those policies will have an exclusion for commercial activity. Um, and frankly, where we're seeing this a lot these days is um, insurance coverage for uh, the Uber and Lyft drivers. They just get regular auto policies and then they basically they use their personal car to for a commercial purpose of, of getting giving rides for money and frequently that, that will be uh, denied and not covered under a policy so I would look at if I'm hauling cattle or other livestock for a commercial purpose I would look at a commercial um, auto policy because so I think you want to ask your agent and again how much are you hauling what are you using to haul it um, you know a someone with a 16 foot cattle trailer probably does not need the same amount of coverage as someone who's, who's pulling a 24 foot trailer um, just because the, the size of it and the, and the amount of cattle is, is you know, it's going to be less money for the 16 foot than the 24 foot. You want it tailored to your needs so you don't overpay with the premium. You also want it to sufficiently cover what you're going to be doing and what you're going to be driving. Um, and then, you know, into segue in that you also, you have a potential, the commercial auto will likely provide coverage for a trailer or your truck that you're hauling with it for a property damage claim and likely also provide uh, liability coverage up to the limits of coverage for, uh, for your action. So if you rear-ended somebody, that might be it too. Um, and, and then, you know, you would want a CGL policy above that and potentially an umbrella policy above that just to make sure you're protected, depending again on how comfortable you are with the risk and what you have to protect and, and the cost of the premium. But you're also hauling uh, cattle or horses or pigs or whatever you're, you're raising in the back. So it, if you were in the accident and something were to happen to those, the animals, the livestock, you may not necessarily be covered under the all policy. So I would also look at um, potential animal mortality coverage, which is out there um, that could cover what you're hauling. Um, you know, uh, it may also cover um, certain incidents. My, my grandfather actually had um, a, a group uh, lightning struck. They were hiding up in the bull woods and lightning struck and it killed, I think about 18 head of cattle. Um, and he made the paper with it, but I don't know if he had animal inch mortality, but that may have been an instance where you might want to have it, those odd times. And, and, and actually, I Googled it because I thought that was rather rare, but it, it, it popped up where there was uh, lightning strike and barbed wire fences, um, et cetera, and, and causing cattle to pass. Um, so 
that's a coverage that's out there that may provide some protection for your loss of livestock. Um, and, you know, again, you're also looking at the risk. I mean, my grandfather, I think, farmed for 40, 50 years. Lightning only struck once for him. Um, but, you know, if, if, for instance, you had, if you had cattle in a floodplain and you thought it might flood and wash them away or cause some injury like that, then you might want to have it and you might want to be specific about flood being covered. Um, and again, that goes back to talking to your agent. This is what I'm doing. This is what I need. These are the risks that I see. And this is where I'm operating. Um, and they can help you find the animal mortality that, that, that is right for you. Because again, just like everything else, there's going to be exclusions. There's going to be areas and things that they don't cover. Um, and you want to be sure that the risks that you foresee and that your agent foresee are covered. Um, things that you think are going to happen are covered is, is what you want to protect yourself from. And then in addition to livestock, um, some of the members and people participating are also growing crops. Um, so you touched on that a little bit earlier. What kind of protection is out there for crops? And I think that's probably very, um, you know, up mind for a lot of people after the ice storm and flooding and things like that that's been happening. Yes. So the one thing I would like to say for crop insurance is it, it is very complex. There are lots of coverages out there. There are intricate coverages. There are coverages that are designed to protect you against certain things and not others. Um, they are updated all the time um, on at least an annual basis. There's going to be new coverages. There's going to be minute changes to old coverages. There's going to be coverage that goes away. So I, I think there are three things to keep in mind for crop insurance. And, and one, we've gone over it, I think, a lot to, to this evening is choose an agent who is familiar with crop insurance. It is extraordinarily complex. I, um, as I sit here today, I, it, it, would take a, it would take several hours upon hours to explain all the ins and outs of crop insurance. Frankly, I am not an expert. Choose an agent who is familiar with crop insurance, familiar with your crop, and familiar with the insurance for that crop. Um, and then I also would say in order to write and uh, write insur crop insurance coverage, the agents have to be up to date on their education, um, on their educational requirements. There's a minimum amount of, of updates and continuing education that they need to get. So make sure that they're up to date on that. Um, there are there are different coverages for different crops and each one of those gets in way out into the weeds on the specific details of the coverage available. So I would say also ask the agent, you know, or if you're growing corn, I would want an agent who writes a lot of corn insurance. Um, same thing for tobacco or soybeans, whatever you're growing. I would want an agent who is up to date on all the issues with that type of crop insurance um, and know what they're talking about. Um, and then you need to tell your agent what you're growing. How are you going to grow it, where you're growing it, and what you're going to do with it? Because if you are growing corn for grain to support your cow-calf operation, for instance, the coverages that you're going to need are different than someone who is growing, uh, say, soybeans to take the market. The risk the um, potential loss is just, it's, it's different and you need different coverage. So you need it tailored to specifically what you're doing, how you're doing it, and what you're gonna do with it are the big three things that you need to cover for your, with your agent when you're buying crop insurance. The second thing I would say is take advantage. No, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead, you go ahead. Okay, um, the second thing I would say is take advantage of, uh, of the available uh, resources to educate yourself. You know, there are, like I said, it's a complex area of insurance. There are multiple acronyms, different coverage options, terms. They're constantly changing. So, you know, maybe before you see the agent, you might want to get a little bit of background on, uh, on what the available coverages are, what kind of terms they're going to be using, um, update yourself on anything new that might be out there. There might be some new coverage that you really want. There might be some aspects of coverage you currently have that have changed and you really want to avoid that. So I would look, go to, uh, you know, we want to check out the Farm Service Agency. They obviously, excuse me, they often 
have programs for education on crop insurance, and then your local extension office uh, frequently provides education as well, including often webinars that you can watch. Um, you know, you don't have to go anywhere. You can watch it after you, after you get done work in the fields that day. Um, and then we talked about it earlier, but records, 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 document everything. This is particularly important for crop insurance. Um, it is possible to get audited, so you need to keep your records and get them backed up. Um, you also need to be specific about where the crop was grown and be able to demonstrate bushel per acre um, for each farm that you're operating. Sometimes, I mean, some people even do it down to the field, the specific field of how many bushels per acre that field um, produced. <clears throat> you also can't lump together farms. So if you are working farm A, then you go to farm B and work that one, and then you go to farm C and work that one, you can't lump them all and just say, well, all my farms produced, say, 40 bushels per acre. You can't do that. You need to be specific. Farm A produce this much, farm B produce this much, and farm C produce this much. <clears throat> this, if you are selling, this is easy to do when you sell because you can designate the, um, what you drop off as being sold for farm A, this is farm B, and this is farm C, and then you have, all right, this is the amount, this is how much I sold it for, um, and this is where it came from. You can do it easily with that. <clears throat> The final is um, the, this information is, is, is not only helpful for helping you make a claim. I mean, if, if you make a claim for crop insurance, I mean, the ultimate goal is to be compensated for your amount of loss. Well, you need to probably be able to demonstrate how much you've been, how much that piece of land has been producing in the past to give you some kind of idea of what you may have lost. That's very helpful for proving that. Um, and then finally, really, it's often, uh, it's more often than not, it's required to demonstrate um, your bushel per acre on the land in order to get insurance. They're going to base your premium um, a lot of times off of how much you're producing because they're looking at it. Well, if something happens, how much am I going to have to pay out? Um, so that may be a basis for your premium. Well, thank you, Greg. Those are all the questions that I had. Um, and I know we've added a few that some of the members had sent ahead of time, but uh, Nikki, did you get any other questions or do you have anything you want to follow up with? I didn't. The only thing that um, I did get and just wanted to say to you guys, I know that we've talked about how important it is to have a good agent and do your homework there, but it's also good to have a good relationship with an attorney, you know, you never know when you will need one. And we tell our members that all the time. Um, it's good to at least have that relationship um, with an attorney or with a legal firm so that when something does happen, you don't have to go out and search for that. You already have that relationship. And we, you know, I think we all hope that something drastic doesn't happen, but at the same time, you know, go ahead and have that relationship. So I would add from a trade association side that as much as it's good to have a great agent and especially for the conversation we've had tonight, it's also good to have a good relationship with an attorney. Thank you, Nikki. And I agree. I mean, um, I feel like an attorney that already knows your business and that right. kind of thing and um, knows what's important to you, what you value. And in the um, articles that are in the Cow Country News every month, there's usually some sort of spotlight on a legal issue and how an attorney can help make that issue easier for you if it's something that you feel like your business is facing or could potentially face. Um, as you've heard tonight, Greg is a wealth of knowledge. I learned so much. <laughs> so. I feel like if you have any specific questions or if what the agent said is confusing or you're trying to decide between two different insurance carriers or two different agents, things like that, um, I think it, an, an attorney that understands your business can definitely be helpful with a lot of these different aspects that we've presented webinars on. Yeah, I don't see any other questions, Candace, but I do, like I said, I know we recorded this and it's been a, a great conversation. Uh, I learned just as much too. And I took my notes because we do, you know, at our office, we get a lot of questions about what to do in this case, or, or sometimes something has happened and we need to refer them um, to kind of what their options are. So I think this has been a great conversation. Um, is there anything else that you all want to add? 
just that we would be no, happy to. Thinking... Sorry, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> I was just going to say, you. if thank anybody you has leader questions or something, then feel free to reach out to us. Um, our contact information will be on the presentation. And so we'd be happy to continue the conversation, you know, if anybody has other questions. That's all I was going to say. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all again for your time tonight. Uh, again, if any of our uh, attendees or anybody who happens to rewatch this um, on our YouTube channel, just feel free to. Um, email myself at the KCA office and I'll pass along uh, Candace and Greg's information like we said was on the webinar and uh, again I can't thank you guys enough for, and then the friendship that we have our office with Steptoe and Johnson so it's always good to have friends that know all of the important stuff to share so thank you all again so much thank, thank you, you.